So we've been talking about stewardship. We've talked about the stewardship of our lives, our entire selves being given to the purposes of God because we are not our own, but we belong to the one who made us. And in that process, we've talked about being stewards of our bodies, this physical self that we have and the importance of caring for it and, and making sure we live in ways that allow it to be able to be used by God. We talked about being stewards of our souls, of that peace of God within us and the need to remove the things that keep the light of God from shining in us and the need to nurture and care for that peace of God's self that lives within us. We've also talked about stewardship of our minds. In fact, last Sunday I talked about how important it was for us to learn how to separate our feelings from our thoughts and from our actions. To not allow our feelings to, to drive us into actions that we later will regret, but to instead learn to distinguish between those and to cultivate a mind that's capable of being able to separate the feelings from the facts and make decisions about how to act. Well, I'll tell you what, this week was a great opportunity to put that into practice, wasn't it? It cost me. It was hard. It was hard to deal with the feelings that rose up in me that made me angry and hostile and vindictive and to say, yeah, that's really what I'm feeling right now. But then to be able to breathe a little deeper and to say, but God, what am I going to do? What am I called to be in the face of this? And that was a hard process. And today, I want to talk to you about being stewards of our wealth. But not just our wealth. I want to talk about our responsibility to be stewards of the common wealth or the common good. Because in many ways, I think that is what Jesus most seeks of us. In fact, when you look at Jesus' preaching, there's one topic that Jesus spends more time on than any other, and it's not sex. It's money. It's money. It's what do you do with your money. Jesus has more to say about wealth and what we do with it about rich and poor than he has to say about any other single topic in the entire Gospels. And yet, it seems to me we struggle to talk about that ourselves. We struggle to recognize how central what we do with what we have is to who we are as people and to what our faith really means. In the discipleship, Desayuno y Discipulado, the breakfast and discipleship group on Monday mornings, we are studying Luke's gospel right now. And, and more than the other gospels, although it's present in all of them, Luke's gospel presents Jesus as a prophet. And it's Luke's gospel that carries the words of Mary's song, which we sang about the turning and the overturning of power and control in our world. It's Luke's gospel that has the story of the rich man and Lazarus who is walked over and ignored by the rich man day in and day out. It's, Jesus, it's Luke's gospel that has the story of Jesus announcing the beginning of his ministry with the words from the prophet Isaiah, God has sent me to preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, liberty to the captives, and to proclaim the year of God's favor. And it's Luke's gospel it's Luke's gospel that has that parable of the Good Samaritan. It reminds us that it's not which neighbors I have to take care of, but am I embodying the neighborliness of God? As we've looked at those stories, we've talked in that group about rich and poor. And one of the things that we've said very clearly is that, you know, there are some very incredibly and amazingly generous rich people, like the Gates family, 
decided that instead of passing on the billions of their inheritance to their children, they are giving that inheritance to their human family in the source of incredible gifts to research and to the eradication of diseases that destroy millions of lives on a daily or on a yearly basis. It is possible to be very wealthy and to be very generous, but it's also possible to be very wealthy and be very stingy. I listened to a podcast uh, called The Hidden Brain this week, and it was a story of a sociologist who became a wealth manager so that she could learn about the internal ideologies of billionaires in this human family. And one of the things that she discovered is that many of them believe it is their moral obligation not to pay taxes because it's just a waste. They can do much better things, make much better decisions and use of their money than governments can. The commitment to the common good is very different from that perspective. We also talked about how poor people can be very generous or can be also very stingy. <laughs> some who are poor who care about the common good in remarkable ways and others who don't at all care about the common good and will steal whatever they can from whomever they can in order to survive. But then there's poor people like the two folks I experienced in Guatemala when I was first getting to know that country. Two experiences of generosity that changed my life. One of them was a woman, an indigenous woman, who invited us into her home when we came to visit. And she said, would you like a tamal? And I said, sure, I love tamales, you know. And then she came and said, forgive me, I only have one left, but can you share it? And insisted that we eat the last bit of food in her home. Me, a North American who had more food than he needed. And she was giving it away to a gringo. I couldn't believe it. I'm not that generous. <laughs> I'm not going to give away my last piece of food. But she did. And then there was a family who lived in a little house that was about as big as this corner divided in half by a, a little curtain. And on one side they had a dirt floor and a potbelly stove and on the other side they had a dirt floor and a cot on which mom and dad and both children slept every night. And I was to spend the night with this family and I brought a sleeping bag and a mat expecting to sleep on the floor. They would not allow me to sleep on the floor. And so while mom and dad and both children slept on the dirt floor that night, I slept on the only bed in the house. You don't experience things like that and walk away unchanged. Jesus wants us to see ourselves as part of a much bigger whole than just me and mine. Now in politics, the operative concept is self-interest. That politics is essentially the negotiating and the, the interchange between my self-interest and your self-interest. And my self-interest may mean me as a, as, a, as a pastor. It might mean my self-interest as me as a, as, a, as a dad and a family member. It might mean my self-interest as a member of a particular political party. It might mean my self-interest as a member of this country versus another country. Self-interest is what we engage with one another around. But here's the deal. You can draw that self-interest circle very tightly or very broadly. I can see my self-interest as only mine, where I don't care what happens to anybody else. I just care about myself and whether I'm doing well or not. 
and I can make my decisions and I can engage the world from that very tiny, small circle of self-interest. I can do that. But I can also widen that circle. I can widen it to include my family. I can widen it to include my neighborhood. I can widen it to include all the people of my ethnic group or maybe every ethnic group. I can widen it to include my nation or I can widen it to include this planet and every person and creature upon it. But here's the deal. Negotiating issues of self-interest is really easy when the circles are small. Every time you make that circle bigger, it gets a whole lot harder. It gets a whole lot harder. If I just have to negotiate what's going to happen between me and my wife, it's one thing. If I have to bring all the rest of the family into that negotiation, it becomes a lot more complicated. If I have to bring the extended family in, more complicated still. If I have to bring my whole church family in, more complicated still. You see? So it's tempting to draw that circle small because it's easier. It's simpler. It's less complex. But friends, here's what I've learned. Jesus will not let you draw that circle small. Jesus will not let you draw that circle small. And that's what today's text is about. It's the only, only last judgment text on Jesus' lips. And it's not really about personal last judgment. It's not about judgment of individuals. It's the nations that are gathered before God. And it's the nations that must respond for the soul of their country, if you will. What have you done with what was given to you? How have you cared for the common good? How have you stewarded what I have given you? And the criteria of salvation in this scenario have nothing to do with claiming Jesus as Lord and Savior. It has everything to do with claiming those around you as Jesus. <laughs> Are you going to be Jesus in my eyes so that I have to serve you? Is the immigrant family with or without papers going to be Jesus in my eyes so that I have to serve them? Is the child who is at risk of abuse going to be Jesus in my eyes so that I have to figure out how to protect you? Is the woman who is without a job someone who I see as Jesus in my eyes so that I care what happens to her well-being? Jesus says, you visited me in the prisons. You gave me something to drink. You clothed me. You welcomed me when I was a stranger, a foreigner. Or you didn't. And that is the foundation of judgment. It seems to me that what Jesus is saying to us is that the soul of a nation will be judged not on how many big buildings it makes, how much money it generates, what size the GNP is, but the soul of a nation will be judged on how we care for the most vulnerable in our midst. And that is what we are to be stewards of. The common good. Not just my good but our good. How are we going to do that? I ran into my son Owen yesterday and he and uh, Beverly had a safety pin on and I asked him, sorry, I asked him what that was about. And they said, this is, this is a very subtle sign to say to someone in our community who may be at risk of being hurt by whatever comes, that I will stand with them, that I will not let them suffer alone, 
but I will not let them be discriminated against without saying something in their defense. It's a small sign to say, I am with you, I am alongside you, and I will not let you be destroyed without giving of myself. Our church has a hundred year history, a wonderful hundred year history of standing beside people who others didn't stand beside. It's our heritage, friends. It's the soul of this church. It is, it is our inheritance to be guarded and cared for and handed to the next generation. I've already had a couple of conversations with folks in this congregation because there are people in our midst who might be among those who could get deported. What are we going to do? My friend Alan Mairena, Reina's son, in Philadelphia is involved in an enormous effort to provide sanctuary to folks in the undocumented community who are being targeted. They actually have figured out how to anticipate where INS raids are going to happen and then they go there as a protective witness to what happens. I don't know what's coming, but I am not going to be bitter. I am not going to be hostile. I am not going to let those emotions take over. But I am going to claim my common humanity with the folks who might be at risk now. I am. And I do that not because I'm a Democrat, because I'm a Christian. Amen. I do that because the Jesus that I read here is one who says, my salvation and the salvation of my nation relies upon my ability to stand in solidarity with the ones nobody else will stand with. So, I hope you get one of these, and I hope you read it, and I hope it moves you to tears the way it has moved me to tears. To listen to the stories of the men and women who chose to stand beside this neighborhood for many years, for most of their lifetimes. And I hope you will become one of them in your generation. Because Jesus calls us not to protect my self-interest, but to protect the common good, to be stewards of the common good, what benefits each and every one, and especially the littlest. Let us pray. Amoroso Dios, gracias por el ejemplo y testimonio de Jesús que en todo lo que hizo y todo lo que dijo se puso al lado de los más vulnerables. Ayúdanos en nuestro momento rededicarnos al esfuerzo solidario que es nuestra herencia de más que 100 años para que seamos salvos para que seamos tuyos. Amén.